all your school rugby all in one place. This is Next Gen 50. All right, guys, welcome to Next Gen 15. So today's video topic, we're going to be looking at 10 young stars that shone bright but short. If you are new to the channel, please don't forget to click that subscribe button as well as bell notification. And as soon as new videos are released, you'll be the first to know. At number 10, we have Christian Wade from England. Now, Wade burst onto the international scene at youth level, having played for the England under-20 team while still in school. He would go on to score eight tries and eight appearances for the under-20s, and in his final years, an under-20 was caught up to the England Saxon squad. In the 2011-2012 season, despite three months out of the injury, he finished second on the Premiership's try-scoring charts and was selected for England's tour to South Africa. By the end of the 2012-2013 season, his star was on the rise. He was the leading scorer in the Premiership as well as being voted the Players' Player of the Year and Player of the Year. His form was rewarded with an English debut as well as being called up to the British and Irish line squad. His English debut, however, would be his only appearance in an English jersey. Problems with form and injury resulted in Wade and Wasps parting ways in 2018, after which he decided to focus on a career in the NFL, signing with the Buffalo Bills. Age 29, there are rumours doing the rounds that Wade may be open to offers from rugby league clubs, but he has mentioned that he will be putting everything he has into his NFL career. At number 9, we have Winston Stanley from New Zealand. Now, Winston Stanley made his debut for Auckland aged only 18, and anyone who saw him play knew that a world-class prospect was on its way. A member of the Stanley sporting dynasty, Winston was selected for the New Zealand Under-20 squad for the 2009 edition of the Under-20 World Championships, where he helped the Baby Blacks to a tournament victory and was subsequently nominated as one of the RB Junior Players of the Year. He was dogged by injuries throughout his career, and he would go on to become a journeyman, having represented the Blues, Force and Highlanders in Super Rugby before heading over to Harlequins in England. His career at Harlequins had resulted in only one try in 19 appearances before he decided to hang up his boots due to persistent injury, aged 29. At number 8, we have Ollie Barkley from England. Now, Ollie Barkley's talent was already evident at school level, where he was a shining light in the legendary Colston's rugby squad that dominated English schools rugby in the late 90s and early 2000s. He made his debut for Bath aged only 19 and was an immediate hit. There was hardly a weakness that existed in his game. He was seen as a graceful left footer whose tactical awareness, defensive work and game-breaking ability was seen even by Clive Woodward, who called him up to the England national team in 2001, aged just 20. Barkley certainly had a well-respected career that would have been the envy of many, having scored over 2,000 points for Bath and been capped by England 23 times. He did not, however, become the world-class pivot everyone expected. With Johnny Wilkinson still in his prime at the time, and no real succession plan in order, Barkley continued a highly respected club career, but would never really stamp his authority on the international stage. At number 7, we have Robert Aberson from South Africa. Now, the Aberson twins Robert and C.S. terrorized the opposition at school level and were leaders of arguably the greatest first team ever produced, the Grey College team of 2007. After leaving school, the young centre turned down far more lucrative offers to stay at the Cheetahs, the union for which he had turned out at age group level. Two years in the South African under-20 team followed, including one as captain, where he scored four tries in ten appearances as well as being a key player for the Blitzbocker. Despite consistently being one of the best centres in the country, he was always overlooked for Springbok selection year after year, and in 2013 he decided to leave the country to join Montpellier in France. Seven years later and over 100 appearances in France, Aberson remains a highly thought of professional player in the country. It must be said that Aberson's unfulfilled potential has far more to do with him being overlooked by size obsessed South African selectors than his playing ability. Had he been given the opportunity, who knows what may have been. At number six, we have Luke Braid from New Zealand. Now, Braid came from good rugby stock with his father Gary and brother Daniel, both representing the All Blacks. A prodigious talent at Tauranga Boys, Braid was selected for the New Zealand Under-18 squad in 2006 where he was a standout. Just two years later, he would go on to showcase his world-class potential, winning the first ever Under-20 World Cup with New Zealand and being voted as the RRB Junior Player of the Year. 
Founding game time hard to come by for the Chiefs. He moved to the Blues in 2011 and he would go on to represent them 69 times in total before moving to France with Bordeaux in 2015. In 2019, he exited his contract and is currently a free agent. At number 5, we have JJ Hanoran from Ireland. In 2012, the RB Under 20 World Cup was won by South Africa. It was their first and only tournament victory. However, in that very same tournament, they were defeated by an exceptional Irish team in the pool stage 23-19, and it was in this game that J.J. Hanoran showcased his exceptional talent. He began his rugby career at Rockwell College, where he was their star player, leading them to a Munster Cup final in 2010. He would go on to play in 220 tournaments for the Irish, notching up a reputation as a playmaking flower with an exceptional boot, racking up 61 points in 16 appearances. Hanoran has had a respectable yet not exceptional career at Munster and won five caps for Virgin Ireland but certainly did not achieve what those of us who saw him at the 2012 tournament would have thought him capable of. Number four, Johan Hoerson from South Africa. Now many pundits believe that Hoerson was the best number 10 to have ever played the game at school level in South Africa. His feats at school level were the stuff of legend with goal kicks from 65 metres, not uncommon. His distribution, tactical kicking and ability to carve up opposition defences made him the talk of South African rugby. Horsen's transition into senior rugby was seamless. A pivot for the Cheetahs, he was nothing short of a point-scoring machine with 331 points in only 27 appearances. In 2012, he was rewarded with Springbok selection and acquitted himself exceptionally. A star was born and South Africa finally had an answer to Dan Carter. However, injuries would go on to curtail the young Hoerson's career, and after a move to France in 2014, his Springbok career had been put on hold. He was subsequently called back to the Springbok squad during Alistair Kutsia's ill-fated tenure as coach, where he performed well. However, since Rassi Erasmus took over, Hoerson has not been seen as a part of the coach's plans. Still aged only 27 and still an amazing player, time is on Hoerson's side but he certainly did not become a 100-plus cap springbok and a global star that he should have been. Number three, Danny Cipriani from England. Now, Cipriani is perhaps the most naturally talented rugby player of his generation, a player that was the heir apparent to legend Johnny Wilkinson. An all-round sportsman, Cipriani was offered football terms by Reading and was a county-level squash and cricket player. He made his debut for Wasps while still at school and would go on to appear 93 times for the London-based club, scoring 688 points in the process. In 2007, aged just 20, he had his first taste of success winning the European Cup as a starter. The future was indeed looking bright for the young prodigy. 2008, however, was the year that Cipriani really had the opportunity to make the English jersey his own after an injury to Johnny Wilkinson. However, two poor displays against South Africa resulted in him being dropped from the team. Off the field incidents crept into his life as well, with training ground bust-ups not uncommon and a high-profile relationship with model Kelly Brook resulting in critics questioning whether he had the appetite required to succeed in rugby. In an attempt to revive his rugby playing career, a move to the Western Force was completed in 2011 where he showed glimpses of his talent. In 2012, he returned to England and joined moderate success with Sharks and a return spell with Wasps before moving to Gloucester, where he remains. While having a respectable career, there is no doubt based on talent alone, Cipriani had all the ingredients to become a legend of the game. It was, however, not meant to be. At number two, we have Tyler Blandall from New Zealand. Now, Blandall was a product of Christchurch Boys, and he was a name on everyone's lips, even as early as school level. In 2010, he was named as captain for the Baby Blacks for their defense of their Under-20 World Cup title. He performed exceptionally well in the tournament, scoring 82 points in only five appearances and being named on the shortlist for the IRB Junior Player of the Year Award. Staying in the South Island at Crusaders instead of looking at other opportunities, the player's game time was limited, having Dan Carton and Colin Slade ahead of him in the pecking order. In 2015, he accepted a contract to play for Munster in Ireland, where he would go on to achieve success, notching up 375 points in 62 appearances. In 2020, however, he was forced to retire due to a persistent neck injury. A player who had a successful, if unspectacular, career, and one whose star should have shone far brighter. And at number one, we have James O'Connor from Australia. Now, to say that a player that has over 50 caps for his country is unfulfilled talent speaks volumes about just how much talent O'Connor really had. 
The Nudgee College prospect became Super Rugby's youngest ever debutante at 17 years of age and became the second youngest Wallaby aged only 18. Playing for the Western Force, Connor was a standout, notching up 306 points in 39 appearances before his 21st birthday. A move to the Rebels followed, where he averaged nearly 10 points a game before moving overseas with spells at London Irish, Toulon and the Sale Sharks. He has in recent times over made headlines for more for his off-the-field antics and is currently back in Australia representing the Reds. His sheer talent has carried him through his career, but had he focused solely on his rugby and exercised more discipline, there's no doubt in anyone's mind that O'Connor could have become a legend of the game. If you appreciated this video, please don't forget to smash that like button. And if you have not yet, get with the program and click that subscribe button as well as bell notification. While you're here, if you're interested in more quality content, why not head over to our website, www.nextgen15.com. That's www.nextgenxve.com. Cheers.